Hey everybody, welcome to Texas Chat. I'm Serge. I'm Rob. I'm Gen Z. I'm Gen X. And just recently we did a reaction to The Last Battle by Sabaton. And now we're gonna learn about the history behind the song. Um, I knew like a very brief overview of the context behind the history, which is um, German and American forces actually um, teamed up towards the end of the war in this, in this conflict in order to um, attack this one castle fortress where there was French prisoners being held by other German soldiers. Um, so it's it will be very interesting to hear what they have to say about, um, what Indy Night will have to say about this conflict um, because it is such an interesting piece of history. Right, and in greater context, the reasoning with that, uh, one could guess this alignment happened, because alliance happened because it was at the end of the war for Germany. Um, it was May 5th, 1945, and pretty much Germany was done. Yep, yep, that was so. pretty much right at the end. Yeah. So, with that being said, Rob, are you ready to jump in? I'm ready to get my history lesson. I'm, I'm really eager to, um, to learn of this one. All right, let's jump in. Here we go. Wait, wait, wait. In World War II, Germans and Americans fighting together? Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm glad they made a song on this. Yeah. And it had a good sound to it. Mm -hmm. You hear it, it has did. that kind of like... 80s 90s feel to it doesn't it it does as you were saying uh getting almost like an epic sound the end of something big mm -hmm. during the beginning of the end for the third reich in world war ii the allies planned the invasion of the german homeland rumors had long circulated about Matterhorn. an impregnable alpine fortress stretching all over the northwestern part of austria into which hitler and his loyal followers would retreat if the war ever came to the reich itself the Allies were concerned about deep underground bunkers blasted into the high mountains which could stockpile guns and supplies. Such a fortress could prolong the war for several months. Most of their fears were, of course, unfounded. But deep within northern Tyrol, there actually stood such an old fortress. Schloss Itter had been a medieval castle. Its foundations can be traced back to the 13th century. Over the centuries, the oh, castle had fallen old. into ruin until it was rebuilt in the 19th century. In 1943, it had been seized by the SS and incorporated into the Dachau concentration camp system. The old fairy tale like castle became a prison for high profile prisoners. Some of France's most influential politicians and generals, like Edouard Daladier, Maurice Gamelon, Michel Clemenceau, and Paul Reynaud, were even held there. Hmm. By the end of April 1945, the noose was tightening around the Germans. The yep. Red Army marched deep into Hungary from the east. German forces had surrendered in Italy to the south, and the Western Allies advanced towards Tyrol from the west. What was left of the shattered remnants of the German army flooded back into Austria, and Tyrol grew full of the last diehard Wehrmacht and Waffen SS troops, whose mere presence would keep many other soldiers from surrendering. But. There was also another group there that is often overlooked, the Austrian resistance. After mm -hmm. the Anschluss in 1938, there had always been a number of native Austrians who stood against the Nazis. For many years, they could only offer passive and nonviolent opposition. But with the Allies just a few miles away, they could finally act. They provided valuable intelligence mm -hmm. about the German defenses and directed the army spearheads through the Inn River Valley. But their most important goal was to protect the Austrian citizens from bloody reprisals by the SS. Already people were hanging white flags and Austrian flags out from their windows, and the SS did not hesitate to open fire on wow. these defeatists. Hmm. The mood inside Castle Itter was dark. The French VIPs, very important prisoners, feared that the SS guards would rather execute them than release them to the Allies. But then on May the 4th, after the last commander of Dachau shot himself in his quarters and the SS officer in charge took that as his cue to disappear, the castle was suddenly empty. Bueno and Clemenceau took a stroll out of the castle gates and into Itter village, but quickly turned hmm. around. The roads were still full of patrolling SS troops, setting up roadblocks and machine gun posts. Back in the castle, the French VIPs discussed their situation. It was clear that they were still trapped and that it probably wouldn't be long until the SS reminded itself of their existence. So they came up with a plan. First, they would sew together a French tricolor banner and hang it from the inner walls to alert Allied aircraft to their presence. Next, they would get in contact with a rather unlikely member of the Austrian underground resistance. 
SS Captain Kurt Siegfried Schrader mm -hmm. could have played the stereotypical Nazi villain in a mm -hmm. Tarantino movie. Highly decorated, he had served as a bodyguard in Hitler's headquarters. After being badly wounded in desperate fighting in France, he broke with the Fuhrer and defected to the resistance. Oh. Schrader promised okay. to help, but he knew that his authority could only buy them some time. If any higher-ups in the SS decided to storm the keep and kill everyone in... Interesting that he defected, um, especially considering he was SS, he wasn't just normal, because there was the Waffen SS, which were like the elite unit, yeah. and the most brainwashed um, of the bunch, and then there was the standard mil German military with the Wormrocht. Mm -hmm. um, I might not be pronouncing that correctly, but those are like kind of the two very well-known groups, which is like the standard military, and then the SS, which are the elite units, which are um, the most imposing and most brainwashed. Um, they're, they're like kind of <laughs> given this doctrine from a very, um, many of them from a very early age signing up into, I think there's like um, Hitler youth uh, programs where there'd be kids being raised from a very young age, kind of like in a Cub Scout setting sure. where they'd be basically taught all these different things. And then when they, with the idea that when they grow up, they become like these Waffen SS or in general, these um, person now that is super dedicated to Hitler and his cause. Um, and some of them were so dedicated, in fact, that when the war was over, they were in disbelief, and many of them committed suicide because they couldn't imagine a world without mm -hmm. Hitler because mm -hmm. that, that was kind of their their doctrine was he was kind of like an idol in a sense. He, and that's what the way Hitler wanted to portray himself because he had portraits of himself painted and put all over Germany. But in general, Hitler very much portrayed himself in a certain way and had all these programs dedicated to brainwashing. Mm -hmm. um, and, and on the note with the uh, SS guards, many of them, were, I, I'd read were not too uh, educated as well. And many of them were actually uh, thugs. Um, and right. so- In the way that they handled, yeah. Yeah, and, and so uh, not having maybe the most sharpest critical thinking skills as well, um, they were given great power and authority or not you know extreme power and authority and so they they were drunk on that power they're drunk with authority they're drunk with um uh having so much um just clear dictatorial uh, mm. commands over a lot of other troops mm -hmm. and so um they also helped to preserve that among themselves as well they didn't mm -hmm. want to share that right. so uh yeah to your point a lot of them were brainwashed and a lot of them were um were drunk with the power that was given mm. to them yeah and because of that that power that was given to them they instilled fear in those around them not only from um from those who are against them but even like their own like soldiers like let's say standard army soldiers they mm -hmm. would even they would be nervous when they see like a waffen ss officer um just standing around and what you just reminded me of with like it let the giving them that power especially since a lot of them are, could be like young boys right who are who are just entering the military um it reminds me of the prisoner experiment where uh, it was, I think it was a more of a modern day experiment um, where it basically was like, it was done at a school and some students were made prisoners and some students were made guards and they had to, and they wanted to see what, uh, they were basically told that they could do whatever they want. The prison and the students who are the guards, they would handle the prisoners in whatever the way they want. And mm -hmm. they had to uh, end the experiment early because the, the students who were role playing as the guards in the prison were took so too serious. They took right? it so serious and they were so rough with the other kids yeah. that they had and like abusive that they had to just call off the whole thing. Yeah. And so it kind of reminds me of that where like power can get to people's heads. Yeah. Um, but in general, <laughs> taking it all back, the reason um, to this one moment, the reason why I'm surprised that um, he surrendered as a Waffen SS officer is because, like I said, SS, SS were like some of the worst mm -hmm. in the war mm -hmm. from, from the Nazi side. And many SS officers were executed for their war crimes. So the fact that he's defecting like one uh, is a surprise because many, maybe he's hoping that it will give him a, a more of a slap on the wrist. Maybe he'll get a lighter punishment mm -hmm. as a result of helping the other side um, because uh, many, many SS officers were immediately executed for the horrible war crimes they committed after the war. All right. So. Yeah. All right. Let's see. Inside, his rank could not prevent it. All agreed that only the quick arrival of the U.S. Army would save their lives. Mm. <laughs> Quick question. I know we're listening to the history, mm -hmm. but on the lyrics, Jenny at the gates. Mm -hmm. I've heard that before, but I've forgotten what that means. Do you know? Or do you no, recall? I was actually wondering. I, thought, I was wondering if that was a name that was 
like Jenny yeah. at the gate. Because there's a couple, there's another moment in the song where they mentioned a couple other names. Okay. Oh, we'll find out. Yeah. They sent out the Czech cook to establish contact, but halfway to the American lines in the town of Virgo, he was nearly caught by a patrol. But being pulled into a nearby house saved his life. His savior was Major Joseph Gangle. Hmm. Gangle was a career soldier in the Wehrmacht since 19. 19- there one. it is, Wehrmacht. So there was the Waffen SS, the elite. Wehrmacht is like the standard military. So this is like a standard military um, leader. But it sounds like a general probably defected as well. Let's see. Mm-hmm. Well, the major, you mean, right? Uh, major, pardon me. Yeah. yeah. Major Joseph Gangle. Gangle was a career soldier in the Wehrmacht since 1935. From the war's beginning to Stalingrad, Normandy, and Bastogne, no. Gangle had seen everything, but he too had returned a disillusioned man and, like Schrader, chose to betray his oath to the Nazis. Now, we don't quite know how such decorated soldiers gained the trust of the resistance, but at the moment, mm. it mattered little. Gangle and the Czech cook set out to find the Americans. Driving just a few miles cross country, they suddenly spotted several Sherman tanks in a small village. Slamming on the brakes, Gangle, still wearing his uniform, got out. And by the way, Sherman tanks are American tanks. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the most common in the war. Hands in the air. He was led to the nearest U.S. officer, Captain John Kerry Lee. After listening to their story, Lee radioed headquarters. And after a quick exchange, the 27-year-old former college football star from New York enthusiastically declared they were going on a rescue mission. <laughs> Lee's unit was part of the 12th Armored Division, which now, after Hitler's death, was not quite as enthusiastic as their captain to risk their lives fighting diehard Nazis in the final hours of the European War. Lee, however, was determined and set off with his ad hoc task force of seven Shermans. His own tank, the Besotten Jenny, took the lead. At the Jenny, next... at, Jenny the, at the, at the gate. gates, the yes. tank. Yeah. There it is. There it is. Yeah. <laughs> I'm glad that question uh, was answered. Yeah. <laughs> River, We're however. Good. And by the way, that's a nice shot of the of a Sherman tank right there. Hmm. And what's interesting is um uh I've heard the Sherman tanks like I, I forgot where it was in some documentary or, or some piece of media, but Sherman tanks were described as like death traps in the sense that their ar- armor wasn't the toughest. Hmm. Like um f- there's a lot of German tanks that could easily destroy a Sherman. Like for example, a Tiger tank would take would um, a Sherman tank would be no match for a Tiger tank. Um and so because of how um, light the armor was in some cases, you would see um, in the crews, the tank crews would try and strap whatever they can on top of the tank. So you see bed frames being put on that tank. They would see random pieces of rubble, sandbags. They would just they would just try and make that armor more effective in mm-hmm. any way that they can just by putting it on the sides of the tank or and on the front of the tank. Yeah. So. Interesting. Only four of his tanks were able to cross a wooden bridge before it gave way. His force reduced, the column rumbled on. Arriving in Virgo, they were warmly received by the Austrian resistance and joined by a group of German soldiers loyal to Gangle. Hmm. Although the Waffen SS had left Virgo, Lee left two of his tanks behind to support the resistance in case they came back. The two remaining Shermans, the Satin Jenny and Bosch Buster, moved on with the Germans in tow. Close to Itter village, they had to cross another bridge, which had already been wired with explosives. Lee ordered Bosch Buster to stay behind and guard their only route back. Without further incident, Bissot and Jenny and around a dozen American and German soldiers. It's interesting. So out of all the tanks out of the seven, it seems like only one's actually going all the and way we, to the front. Yeah. And that one tank was Jenny, hence why it was so significant as to just name that specific Jenny tank. At the Jenny yeah. at the gate. Yeah. yeah. Soldiers arrived at the castle gates. While the men went inside, Lee ordered Besat and Jenny to turn around to block the entrance. In the castle, perhaps one of the most unlikely scenes of the war took place. An American army captain, a Waffen SS officer, and a German army major made a plan to defend French hostages from loyal Nazis in a medieval Austrian castle. <laughs> I know. Wow. Schrader reported seeing several Waffen SS. It's got to be one of the most uh, multicultural <laughs> battles I've ever heard of. <laughs> There's a lot going on here. I know. Schrader oh, reported know. seeing several Waffen SS trucks moving around carrying anti tank guns. Lee, knowing that American reinforcements were on their way, ordered the French prisoners to seek shelter in the keep while the soldiers took guard at the castle walls. They were only lightly armed with rifles and submachine guns. But the firepower of Besant and Jenny 
would give them a chance. Lee went to bed, but it would be a short night. At 4 a.m., he awoke to the sound of gunfire. A German MG42 was firing at the gatehouse, and Jenny's 50 caliber was answering. Tracer rounds were flying through the dark as the men on the western wall suddenly spotted SS men carrying grappling hooks. The SS was clearly oh. looking for a way in, but the fire from the defenders had spoiled their plans so far. Gangle, Schrader, and their castle krauts kept them at bay, firing from the upper floors while castle the Americans krauts. defended the gatehouse. Trust between the Germans and Americans had been shaky at best, but now none of them would survive if the SS got in. Right, because the SS would kill the German guys as well for being traitors. Right. Shortly after 8.30, things got real. They spotted a 20mm anti-aircraft cannon and an 88mm gun northwest of the castle with truckloads of Waffen SS soldiers arriving. The first 88 shells smashed into the castle and the whole structure shook. Then a staccato of 20mm shells began blasting small gaps into the walls. Things went from bad to worse. Bisat and Jenny rocked violently backwards. Seeing fire spurting from the engine access grills, the crew jumped out of the burning Sherman tank just in time before a second anti-tank shell sealed its fate. Nah. With their chances of survival now seriously reduced, the French VIPs took up arms and joined the defenders at the gatehouse. The elderly Reynaud, France's prime minister early in the war, fired his MP40 through the open window and Gangle ran over to help. But he didn't get far. The man who had seen the European part of the war from the beginning to its final battle was killed by a sniper. Wow. With more 88 millimeter rounds smashing into the castle walls, however, there was no time to mourn him. Waffen SS soldiers were moving up the slopes, pressing home the attack. With the radio blown to pieces, Schrader directed Lee to the castle telephone. Reaching the resistance back in Virgo, Lee yelled into the telephone that they were in need of immediate assistance or they would soon be shelled to pieces. Then another round exploded against the castle and the line went dead. Wow. Germans, Frenchmen, and Americans fought for their lives, but ammunition was running low. With Gangle dead and several Wehrmacht soldiers wounded, they were close to being overrun. Lee began pulling the defenders off the walls and deeper into the keep as he saw a squad of Waffen SS close to the gatehouse. Just as they brought a Panzerfaust into position, mm -hmm. a sudden rattle of heavy machine guns tore into them. Mm, by the way, the Panzerfaust, this, I think this, this footage right here is actually showing it. Mm -hmm. um, it was used as basically like a rocket launcher. And you, you would use it against um, enemy tanks. And that's hence why they brought those with them. Mm. Faust into position, a sudden rattle of heavy machine guns tore into them. Cavalry had arrived, and just in the nick of time, with the additional firepower of the American tanks, the battle took a decisive turn. The remaining SS troops quickly dispersed into the woods, and the castle was saved. All the French VIPs had survived, thanks to one of the least likely alliances of this or any other war. Marcus Linke, who does a lot of the research for these episodes, and I cannot understand why there is not a major movie about right. this story. Right. The Last Battle. It sounds like a movie plot. <laughs> it absolutely does. It would be a fantastic movie. They need to make more great movies like so Saving Pirate I Ryan. understand why you would pick this, but I'm surprised how you... How did you discover this? I can't even remember, actually, if I'm honest. Yeah? It's just how I think it was... An email, a book, or something. Yet. I remember so clearly, like reading about it, how I instantly knew that this is a song. Wow. And it was such a writing the lyrics for, for the first was amazing fun. Just only writing the music as well. Finally, it, you can do something that's a little bit more positive, happy. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And I mean, I like catchy heavy metal. Uh, every does every song doesn't have to be super dark. Yeah. It's, I like it when it's, you know... Yeah, this one had a catchy feel to it. But you guys are fairly bombastic, and it's nice to... Yeah, yeah. I, no, I'm with you. I'm with this you one is like, yeah, the message and the music, uh, and also messing with the fans. We like doing that is in uh, lyrics. We do it every now and then in some of them. Uh, for example, in this case, there's Tank called Jenny <coughs> mm -hmm. uh, in the battle. Yeah. And, of course, we were singing Jenny at the gates as yeah. the SS opened fire. And if... 
I mean, if you haven't read anything, yeah, you, you wouldn't. You don't. Jenny, at what? What? What's this? You know? <laughs> so, yeah, I was. I was like, wait, what? Kind of the question we had. <laughs> yeah, in the beginning. Because I, because I know in um in World War Two and other wars as well, there'd be like stereotypical stereotypical names given to certain soldiers from certain nations. So, for example, Germans would be called Krauts, British would be called Tommies, or um, and also Germans would also be called Jerry's. Um, that's another one. Um, Russians would be called Ivans. So basically, there'd be like generic names given to soldiers from certain nations. And so I was wondering if maybe Jenny is some sort of uh, generic name, but I haven't heard of it. So I assumed it was maybe it was something else. And I'm glad I, once we watched this, we figured out it was the tank that was being referred to. Right. And I don't know other nations, but uh, American uh, pilots would name their planes too. Mm -hmm. You know, paint the name on the side of the plane. So I was wondering if huh. they did that with tanks, if that was common or not. But right. Well, well <laughs> looks like that happened here. Yeah, that's. <laughs> Uh, answer to the question there yeah mm -hmm. yeah i think it was pretty common because i mean um tank crews uh airplane crews they'd be spending a lot of time with their vehicle um not only in combat but also maintenance taking care of it going on trips with it uh, making sure it's up to standard mm -hmm. so it was, it was like a very close relationship between a crew and its vehicle i named it yeah i mean if you haven't read anything yeah, you wouldn't. You don't. Jenny at what? What? What's this? You know. <laughs> so who's she? Yeah, who's this Jenny girl? Yeah. You know. Who is she? What does she mean to you, Joachim? Oh, Jenny's my longtime lover. <laughs> does you, your lady friend watch this? I hope not. But you know, it, it's interesting <laughs> just how just that action of the unlikeliest of people to be fighting with each other because that same year. Something we covered in the Time Ghost uh, series, the Indonesian War of Independence. Late in 1945, in Indonesia, you had the Japanese and British soldiers fighting together. It was the weirdest thing to read that. I'm like, get the fuck out of here. <laughs> that, yep, British and Japanese fighting together. Huh. And this, 1945 was one crazy ass year. Yep. And we're talking about it from uh, 75 years later in another crazy ass year. Yep. Yeah, I mean, this year's not done. We still have an asteroid uh, heading to destroy Earth. We have the wildfires. <laughs> You're releasing your first solo album on October 16th, if I'm not mistaken. R&B album. Yeah, yeah, 90s R&B album. It's and it's called it's called and me, I'm Joachim. From <laughs> <laughs> you complete each other's sentences. Okay, anyhow, back to the last battle. Um, <clears throat> so. Now, how often do you do this one live? Never did it live. That's what I was, I, I was that was my guess. Yeah. But, uh, but it's funny because we've just been talking about the positivity of the, uh, in terms of musicality and stuff. Yeah. Why have you never done it live? Uh, it never be became that popular, actually. Yeah. It's the same, it's weird because you can always guess when you're making an album, is this gonna be a popular song or not? Uh, this one I thought would. Right. So I mean, right. on every album, I predict like two or three, that's gonna be great. Yeah. And I usually have one wrong. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the other way around. These two or three, I, uh, even though they're good songs, I don't think the, the audience or concert going fans. You don't think are, it would be. Would, would but you never line. tested it out. No, uh, but we also be, have statistics on how, many, oh, yeah. how much it's played on radio and streamed and well, stuff. Well, who was it the, the, the... And we actually speak to our fans. So we know oh, yeah, that's <laughs> true, actually. Yeah, they do. And they have this channel, so the fans can speak to them as well. Yep. And that reminds me, bringing things around further, um, you guys were in the middle of touring Russia when, when Corona hit and you had to leave the tour. Yes. Now, as of today, is there... What is the status on any of your touring or shows for the rest of the year or the beginning of next year? Uh, we are on, on go until uh, proven wrong, if you know what I mean. Okay. Uh, we are, which I really like. Our earliest plan is to go back to Russia and finish what we started in November. Sure. Okay. And that's something I'm really happy about. And as it looks now, it's it should be doable. I mean, obviously we're going to follow local laws and regulations. You know, if we won't be allowed to do the tour, we're not going to be dicks and try and enforce, you know, okay. heavy metal <laughs> down people's throats. What about Sabaton Cruise? Sabaton Cruise, so far, so good. Uh, we are going to yeah. leave a notification on the 19th of October, I think. Okay. Uh, we'll have a final meeting with Celia, and then we'll see. Because the thing is here, the Rob only thing we can do is prepare to make everything ready so we can do shows. Yeah. But as you, you all realize here, lo local laws and regulations change on a daily basis. Yeah, sure. But the thing is, I, um, I, don't, I don't see it as a, a big problem. Uh, it, it is a shame if we have to cancel concerts. Yeah. But 
we are going to make sure everybody gets a refund or we're going to reschedule the concerts. And you know, because we've mentioned it before, and I'll say it again, that on the Sabaton Cruise, if it gets to go this year, that I will do bar piano. I will sit there and sing and play a bunch of Sabaton <laughs> songs <laughs> on lounge piano. That'd be fun to hear. I know, it's going to be really fun. I think it's going to be great. That's uh, Yeah, we should film that, actually. I, I don't see how we're going to avoid filming it, because everybody's going to be standing there with their cameras. So, I mean properly. So. With, uh, Do you hear that, Ricard? Does Indy Night, though, play the piano? I guess he does. Wow. Yeah, that'd be really uh, interesting to, to see him play. Yeah, yeah, that's some dedication. He's learning the, the Sabaton songs, and he's able to play them on the piano. Mm -hmm. yes. Wow. You know, sometimes... With us touring so much, yeah, not at the moment though, but it, it's easy to get sort of a, a little bit tired of it. I mean, it's not like I, in the middle of a tour, I want to go and karaoke sing a Sabaton song. Uh, right, yeah, mm, sure. Obviously. That'd be weird. weird. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Especially in between. I like to do and see different things. And I mean, you playing Sabaton songs on a piano in a very different take. Yeah. That is something I would really love to see. And I've, <laughs> yeah, also, me I mean, uh, a lot of uh, artists doing covers of us online. I really enjoy watching it. And yeah. I mean, I think it's the ultimate, uh, what, what we need to remember as artists that even if we, <clears throat> it's a young person who doesn't have any experience, can barely play their instrument, it is still the sort of the ultimate form of a compliment. You can Absolutely. Give, yeah. give a Absolutely. musician. I like your music so much. So I'm not going to write my own. I'm going to perform yours. Instead. And I'm going to perform it in front of other people so I can go, yeah? 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 So I, I love it, actually. But uh, I will say this. Uh, hopefully, the Sabaton Cruise will go ahead, and then I will do the piano show, and you will get to see it right here on Sabaton History. Ooh. Oh, good. We got to look for that one. Yeah, we got to check and see. Did, did the Indian I do upload it to the channel? I'm going to guess that was 2020. Actually, i doing the math. All right, everyone. 2020. You know the drill. You click, 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 click. Get some subscriptions. Check out Indy's other channels. Become a Patreon. That's it. Get the fuck out of here. <laughs> he, he pulled out the line again. He did. <laughs> and don't forget. Click, click, click. <laughs> uh, it was from two years ago, it says. Okay. So uh, September 17th, 2020. You were correct. Mm -hmm. You are right on the money with the year. Yeah. So, Rob... What do you think? What a uh, interesting uh, piece of history there. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I'm thinking to myself, boy, what a ripoff. Meaning, educationally, that would have been a, such a fantastic yeah. piece of history to study. I know, you know, in high school, they have to do, do general uh, um, approaches to history. In college, it gets a little deeper. But mm -hmm. something like that is so significant, right? Yeah. Right? And um, I like how he called for a movie to be made from this. Yeah. I think it would be a hit movie. I think so too, especially if it had the production quality of Saving Private Ryan. Yeah, sure. It's instant hit. Um, it's interesting that he said that this was one of the songs he thought would take off, but it ended up not taking off. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if maybe the fact that so so little people knew about this event um, prior to the song that, that, that maybe that had an influence on less people um, going to see it, like statistically, as he was mentioning. Mm -hmm. um, because if he if they make a song on some famous conflict, like let's say D-Day, for example, um, almost everyone knows about that. D-Day. About D-Day. They're gonna tune into it. So they're gonna watch the song and it's, they're gonna yeah. enjoy it. Um, but for some other songs that are about conflicts that a person might not know, unless the, if they're not willing to go out of their way to learn about it and listen to the song, then maybe there's like a little bit of a um, barrier to entry. Um, mm -hmm. which is something that's a very big thing like a consumer market is the more barrier to entry the less likely people are to go out of their way to seek it so absolutely right yep, yep. But, and uh, a story like this is it's it's more than interesting it's also uh, I know I say this a lot with uh, Sabaton but it's mm -hmm. inspiring and there's a redemptive quality in this because you think of just pure evil right mm -hmm. um, the um, SS um, soldier or SS uh, leader and then the uh, major yep. from the army, uh, Wehrmacht. The Wehrmacht, they epitomized and personified evil mm -hmm. in the Nazi party. And yet they realized that and crossed over from the dark to the light. Mm -hmm. And then to see how they, um, they teamed up with uh, the American soldiers to save um, the, uh, the high political um, Frenchmen. I mean, mm -hmm. it's just a really cool story. I like it. Yeah. 
It was, it was a really uh, interesting one. Yeah. Um, it, I, th I think during the history video, what something I mentioned was, uh, I'm guessing it was the Wehrmacht um, major. Um, I think it, it, they showed a picture of him. Um, I'm not sure if 100% recall it, but I believe that was him. Uh, he served from the very start of the war. Mm -hmm. And he went through lots of major battles. And one of the ones that was named was the Battle of Stalingrad. So it's pretty impressive. Um, his like... <laughs> his list of conflicts that he participated in his because, resume there right the i was about to say resume but i don't know if that was the right word or not <laughs> uh but uh, it's, it's pretty impressive because stalingrad for example that was a um a really brutal conflict and that was actually a, a marked the turning point in the war mm -hmm. um it was where uh, i think it was the german sixth army it was one of germany's biggest armies um it went into stalingrad and it actually got surrounded by soviet forces and, it was, and it, they engaged in uh, urban warfare and like I said, it was a turning point. And afterwards, the Soviets started to push the Germans back and all the way back to Berlin um, till the war's end. And in that uh, one, uh, in that conflict, there were so many deaths. I think there's like over, uh, there's millions who died. Um, and I think the Soviets actually took even heavier casualties. Mm -hmm. um, so they won the battle, but it came at a cost. Um, and so it's surprising that he uh, made it out of there because um, most of the German army got captured. And of the ones that were captured, many of them um, were prisoners of war who end up dying off and so a very small portion survived um, and those who weren't captured literally froze to death right yeah. or, or or got killed in combat right yeah yeah they they were killed in combat. Um, and i i think an interesting little tidbit is the german general i believe who was in charge of the whole operation at uh, stalingrad he made some sort of request to hitler i don't know if it was to retreat or um what it was but he was he he had such a lack of confidence and their sec and like the German army's success, like he knew it was it was already it was gonna be old game over, mm -hmm. that he actually sent his uh, I think it was his wedding ring, um, back on a plane to his bro uh, wife. To his wife. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, you heard you heard about um, that. It's a big story. Yeah. Yeah. So he is it, like it's already like a sign of defeat that he already knew yeah. it was going nowhere. Uh, but all that is to say is it's surprising this guy went through the entire war and, and just less than a week before the end of the war he gets He's shot by a, sniper. by a sniper yeah mm -hmm. so uh, interesting fate there because like uh, you never know how life is going to go uh, yeah and it would have been interesting had he survived to hear his um his recollection of the war mm -hmm. why he turned to the other side and then mm -hmm. even the uh the intel he, mm -hmm. he could have shared right yeah yeah and um in general, it's um, kind of surprising how a lot of these soldiers, they're like the SS and the Wehrmacht, um, a, a lot of Germany soldiers continue to fight th through the end of the war when it was very clear that their side had lost. Um, and I, there's many different reasons for us to why. Um, I guess one of the biggest was brainwashing, disbelief, um, thinking that was propaganda, because um, there was a lot of... Uh, a lot were taken off guard by the fact that the war was lost because mm -hmm. there's always propaganda saying uh, otherwise that we're no we're not losing the war we're actually doing very well in the war don't you dare um don't you dare surrender because then you're gonna get hanged in the streets you're gonna get shot um as it was mentioned here that the ss were shooting those who would put up white flags um and surrender um so it was it was um even at the very end when you think it, it people would have the common sense to um and um, they, they're, they're losing their lives, like I said, less than a week before the war end. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, I think uh, a big part of it, like you said, is disbelief. This cannot be happening. Mm -hmm. uh, honor is another part of it. And we saw a lot of that also in World War II um, on the Pacific front uh, with uh, Japanese when they had lost mm. uh, the war. Um, many of the uh, American soldiers that were POWs were, um, were systematically executed um, even wow. after the surrender. And many of the Japanese uh, leaders and soldiers actually committed suicide mm -hmm. uh, once they accepted that they, in fact, had been defeated and um, mm -hmm. lost the war. Yeah, it's interesting you bring that up because I, I, I believe it was, I forgot where I heard it from. I think it was my history teacher for AP European history back in high school. Um, something he brought up was that uh, even though Japan was clearly going to lose the war uh, if it carried on fighting, um, Japanese culture was very much there was like a mindset of like this is dishonorable to like surrender mm -hmm. and so they would have kept fighting even to like the last man there was no way they were um they were gonna just uh, surrender even if the odds were against them and so the, a lot of American leadership knew this 
And so they knew that if they were to continue fighting, it would take many more years. Mm -hmm. uh, it could take many more years. Many more many lives. Many more lives. Resources, yeah. And so they opted for a what, what was a more um, steadfast solution from their end, which was, the, of course, the dropping of the atomic bombs. The bomb there. And so with, with how much devastation the, uh, that was brought on by, that, uh, by the dropping of the nukes, um, Japan knew that there was no point in carrying on. Mm -hmm. And so the war ended there. Right. Yep. I believe that was August uh, 45. Mm -hmm. I think after the second uh, A-bomb drop, I think it was two days. I, let me know in the comments, but I'm, I'm going from memory here. I think it was two days later, mm -hmm. the uh, Emperor of Japan uh, surrendered. Mm -hmm. And um, the rest is history. Yeah, did, uh, a little side tangent. Did you know there was actually another interesting story, which was there was a Japanese soldier who got yes, lost who in, got lost in the Philippines for forty years. Yeah, and he kept fighting and, on the war, and and yeah. the, there's the, the Japan would even send some of its soldiers to go and tell him the war was over, but yeah. he wouldn't believe them. And I think they actually like traced down one of the guys in his unit, like a close friend of his, to try and go and tell him that it's over. He was uh, seen as a, actually as a national hero in Japan, mm. um, in a pop cultural sense. Um, mm. One of their own, never surrendered, never gave up, and sure. also survived for decades. In the jungles of the Philippines, no. so, yeah, yeah, and, and there's a there's a book uh, some of you guys might know. I think it was called "The Art of Not Giving an F." Uh, it was an audio book. It's free mm. on YouTube if you guys want to check it out. Um, I need to. I, I might have to re-listen to it because <laughs> I, I only listened to it very briefly. But it's. I think it talks about like an interesting approach to life, like living your life and not living it for others, but trying to find true meaning in it. And it, I think he actually mentions that story about that one soldier who got us off and um, he, his meaning was tied to the emperor's last will mm -hmm. um, at the time, right? And so without him carrying on those orders, he had nothing to really to live for. That's his whole meaning became carrying on mm -hmm. that order. Mm -hmm. And he did until, mm -hmm. uh, until he was a very old man. I think uh, he was discovered when he was in his seventies. Was that right? Uh, I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure either. Um, but uh, it's quite a story. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe so. 60s. But anyway, now I want to look it up. <laughs> right. <laughs> look at that. Cybertown has got us discussing history once again. <laughs> uh, once again, and enjoying it. <laughs> history really is fascinating. Mm -hmm. It's not a, a dead subject. It's very alive. Yep. Yep. And we're we're here to keep it alive along yeah. with um with you guys. Yeah. So thank you guys for tuning in. Um, we hope you guys found this informative and interesting just like we did. Make sure you like, comment, and subscribe, and hit the notification bell icon for more videos. And with that being said, have a great rest of your week. Have a great rest of the week, and don't forget, click, click, click. <laughs> All right, guys. <laughs> See you. <here. laughs>